Hi, I'm Linda Eads. This is an update on the Reseum Global Fund, looking specifically at the third quarter of 2018. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the movements in the fund, the returns of the fund during that time period, and then also speak to the positioning of the fund currently given sort of the global backdrop. So looking at the third quarter of this year, the fund was down slightly. Uh, the returns net of fees were negative 0.7%, and that was sort of um, down relative to the global equity market, which at first glance looked quite robust. If you look at the MSCI All Countries World Index, it was up 4%. But if you actually sort of delve further into that, um, that was largely driven by the returns that came out of the US equity market. US equities were up about 7% during the quarter, um, whereas the rest of the market, in particular emerging markets, given the fact that the US dollar was quite strong, um, US interest rates were up, and of course there's been a lot of negative news about US sanctions and escalating tensions between the US and China, um, all of that sort of fed through into quite negative sentiment towards emerging markets in general. And the dollar was also strong against other currencies as well, such as the euro and sterling as well. So it really was the US which had a very robust quarter and that was largely driven once again by the technology stocks. However, since then the technology stocks uh, that had dominated the headlines, some of these have started to come under a bit of pressure. So if you look for instance at Tencent, which obviously our local business NASPASS has a stake in, that is actually down 30% as it stands now, sort of late October, 30% um, year to date. Um, NASPASS as a result is down 20%, um, Facebook is down 15%. So sort of this tech sector, which has been such a driver of US equity returns over the last few years, is starting to show a few signs of strain. Uh, I think the good news for ReCM Global Fund investors is that the returns that the fund has generated since the start of 2016, um, which have been very good, the fund is up 33% um, from that point, has been generated without holding those technology stocks. And I think that's very important because if you hold those technology stocks, which is why the sort of MSCI or Countries World Index is up quite strongly, a lot of that has come from that sort of tech part of the market, then, you know, you're probably not sleeping very well at night because those stocks are on very high valuations and of course there's reams of research to justify those high valuations but nonetheless we know that historically when businesses have been on very high valuations that does represent quite a bit of significant risk in the form of potential downside um, from those levels. So I think the fact that the ReCM Global Fund has performed so well over the last sort of three years despite not holding technology stocks should be a source of comfort for investors because it means that the fund is not dependent on the status quo continuing in order to continue to re generate returns. Um, the Resium Global Fund has got a very good track record of protecting capital uh, during times of market decline and it's precisely because of the way that we invest. Because we are value oriented, uh, we tend to want to invest in good businesses but only when the price is in our favor. So we want to invest with that margin of safety and we tend to steer away from these very excessively highly valued businesses. Um, I know many investors have sort of moved in the direction of owning those stocks and then explaining why they are still value. We don't believe that's our sort of part in your portfolio. Um, it doesn't fit with our DNA and the, the sort of benefit of that to investors is that when those stocks come under pressure, when there's a significant sell-off in the sort of US market because it's had a very strong run, our portfolio is likely to remain fairly resilient as it did during the financial crisis when the rest of the market was down 50% and the fund was down 30% and the market took five years to recover and our fund recovered in two and a half years. So I think that should hopefully be of comfort to the investors. The fund had um, quite a few stocks in it which did perform well during the quarter. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway was up. Um, you would expect that of an insurance company given the fact that interest rates were up. Another stock that contributed to returns during the quarter was uh, the luxury homeware retailer Williams Sonoma. Um, we bought that stock when the price was down as a result of uh, the so-called Amazon effect. Amazon had started to enter into that market selling homeware online and the assumption was that any retailer operating in the same space as them would be decimated by sort of their entry and William Sonoma operates at the sort of luxury sort of part of the market 
Uh, so they sell sort of similar things to what you might find on a yuppie chef. Um, they have a strong online presence as well as sort of the streets uh, that you can visit. And that's very important because if you're going to spend a lot of money on uh, cookware or homeware or rugs or whatever the case might be, you probably want to make sure that that item actually feels as expensive as it is. Um, so they were, we felt, a little bit more resilient as a result of sort of the segment that they operate in. And the numbers which recently came out proved to uh, confirm this. So William Sonoma saw their share price rise, and this is a typical example of the type of stock that we invest in, um, where there's sort of short-term sentiment, a otherwise great business is affected by that, their share price goes down, and if you actually just sort of take a step back and look through the cycle, um, you can actually buy great businesses um, when they're sort of going through some kind of short-term negative uh, sentiment issue which probably won't affect them as much as the market assumes at that point in time. INPEX, which is the uh, Japanese natural gas and oil producer, also had a very good quarter in the portfolio. Um, interestingly, that was not really because the oil price touched $84. It was because their big project off the western coast of Australia has finally sort of become up and running. Their sort of first shipment of natural gas to Japan is imminent, and that has seen two years of delays, which is why the share price had been under immense pressure as a result of all of these delays and additional capital expenditure required, etc., etc. And now sort of the market is starting to celebrate the fact that this operation, um, which looks to add immense value is going to be up and running finally. So that actually was up quite strongly. Um, some of the stocks that didn't do so well in the portfolio were Tesco. That was largely a result of the UK being out of favour during the quarter, um, which was mostly driven by concerns with regards to Brexit uncertainty. Um, and for instance, emerging market exposure such as uh, Standard Chartered, um, which obviously has quite a lot of its revenues coming from the emerging markets. We introduced two new stocks during the quarter, Prudential PLC and Liberty Global. Now Prudential PLC is the uh, sort of multinational financial services group which happens to be listed in the UK, but it does have operations in Asia which we're particularly interested in. Um, it has operations in the US which we believe the market is not giving it enough credit for and its operations in the UK have been improving since the financial crisis. So we think the combination of those three things represents a good value opportunity at the current price. And then Liberty Global is actually a, sort of the global um, parent company of Liberty Latin America, which we introduced into the portfolio earlier on this year. Now, Liberty Latin America was spun off Liberty Global. Liberty Latin America, as the name suggests, houses the Latin American telecommunications um, operations. And Liberty Global has more sort of UK and European assets. Uh, so one of the brands that you will be familiar with there is, for instance, Virgin Mobile. Uh, now, sort of the telecommunications sector as a whole is dominated by economies of scale, which Liberty Global does have, which we like. Um, the market is consolidating. Uh, Liberty Global is in a very, very good position to take advantage of that. And this is uh, an industry which has very good economics generally. Uh, but in particular, we like the fact that this business has revenues in currencies which we believe to be undervalued, namely the euro and the UK sterling, and it has a reporting in the US dollar. So if you actually sort of do the calculations and work out the fair value, um, there is an opportunity there in dollars effectively. Um, so that has been added to the portfolio along with an interesting uh, basket of net nets. Now, um, this is a very small position in the portfolio. It only comprises 2% in total. Uh, you might have heard the term net-net. It was a term that was coined by Benjamin Graham, the sort of father of value investing. Um, this is a company where effectively the share price is below the current assets or sort of the liquid cash-like assets, less total liabilities. So current assets minus total liabilities is effectively an estimate of the liquidation value. If the company had to be liquidated today and you know all its debts paid off, the share price is basically trading below that. So it's inordinately cheap. Um, we've basically put together a basket of these stocks. It's a very small position, but what we know historically is that if you invest in businesses which are trading at such inordinately cheap levels, you really are stacking the odds on your side. And uh, you can control the risk of that by how much you allocate to the position and diversifying that group of net nets as well. So that's a very interesting sort of very value-esque uh, introduction to the portfolio. 
The global fund as a whole, as I said before, is a very robust portfolio, I think particularly given the risks out in sort of the global economic environment. Um, it's not dependent on the status quo remaining. Um, it's not sort of participated in the very sort of concentrated surge of stocks at the top of the US market. It is very diversified. Um, diversification is something that we think a lot about now, uh, given our experience with resources in 2014, 2015. So we spend a lot of time making sure that the investment ideas in the portfolio are unrelated in very different sectors, in very different geographies, um, but all have two things in common. Uh, we're investing in good companies and they're trading at discounts to what we believe to be their fundamental values.